Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. And all the time, God is good. I'm delighted to see those of you who have come to worship God on his holy day, which is today, the seventh day of the week. It is universally unpopular, but I'm glad God has a people who are unafraid to lift up his Sabbath. And you are representative of that group. I also want to welcome those of you who are watching by internet. I was given some instructions by email to personally greet some people who are watching. Uh, some are watching in Nairobi, Kenya, the Ochola family. God bless you. They watch very, very faithfully, by the way. And love it when you do your memory presentation. I think the wife of that family, Sister Christine, is memorizing and her little girl is also memorizing. And over in Kendu Bay, on the shores of Lake Victoria, is uh, Bibi Meggie Odiambo, who is watching. She watches very faithfully. And I got an email last night telling me, please greet Dr. Isabella Hansen over in Norway, who wants to worship with us by internet. And those of you who are watching, I don't know your names, but wherever you are, north, south, east, or west, thank you very much for joining us online. We're grateful for technology when it is used properly. Who is with us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hands? You are not? Ah, please stand. Please stand. What's your name? Carolyn. Carolyn, we're delighted to have you. Who invited you, Carolyn? Patricia. Ah, God bless you, Patricia. Carolyn, we're happy you've come. May God bless you. And bless your family. I mean that from my heart. Please be seated, Sister Carolyn, and please come again. Whether Patricia invites you or not, please come again. <laughs> please. My good brother, what's your name? Chris is a good name. Chris, who invited you? Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, Chris, I'm glad you've come. Let the church say amen for Chris and Caroline. Chris, where do you go to school? Eastern Michigan, just down the road. Well, Chris, we look for you every Sabbath right here. And bring your friends, Chris. Bring your girlfriend with you next time. <laughs> we want to see her. God bless you, Chris. God bless you, Caroline. Chris, study hard. You don't need to be a genius to do well. You need to be disciplined. Are you with me? Be disciplined. Remember why you came, and you will do well. And figure out how you'll use your education, Chris, for the glory of God, who gave you that sharp brain and that handsome face. Let all the ladies say amen. amen. All right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Are you ready for the word of God? It's nice to see you. I, I very infrequently see you. So when I do, I try to enjoy it as much as I can. Um, let me give a testimony of God's goodness. Yes, Sister Pat. Oh, I have sinned, and that's nothing strange with me. Sister, what is your name? Who did I miss? Oh, at the back. Kyle, but Kyle, I've seen you so many times. Why? And you are a visitor? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not yet, okay. Mm hmm. Kyle? All right. You are a visiting member. Well, we're, we're happy to have you, Kyle. Kyle, you and I need to talk about this rebaptism issue. And I'll show you from the word that God wants you rebaptized and to become official member of this church. Let all God's people say amen. amen. Kyle, God bless you. Keep coming. That's Kyle, Chris, Caroline. One K and two C's. Oh, all right, sister. What's your name? I'm glad you told me in words. Yes, what's your name? <laughs> Val. Val. All right, all right. My wife will teach me. She does that kind of stuff. Well, Val, <laughs> Val, thank you for coming, Val. Is this your first time, Val? Been before. Well, keep coming. God bless you. And after I talk to Kyle, I'll talk to you. Not about rebaptism, but baptism. Let the church say amen. amen. All right. Well, we're on this earth to bring people to the truth. Am I right or am I wrong? All right. Well, before I begin the sermon, which is your move, 
Do three things for me. They're very simple. Do you have a cell phone? Please turn them off. Please turn them off. Not down, off. Are they off? Is anyone rebelling? <laughs> you know, churches are the best place to find rebels. It really is. The moment you say go left, church members say, no, I'm going right. Why? Because he said go left. That's the way we are. Now, I'm asking you, don't rebel. Please turn your phones off. Are they all off? All right. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And all I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And that is based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together. Mark 12.28, and one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, Jesus would reason, if you listen and you think, it would be very difficult to turn your back on the religion of the Bible. It appeals to a thinking mind, and the Holy Ghost does not bless an idle mind. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you, Father, for the tremendous privilege to assemble in this sacred holy place to worship you. As we do so, dear God, grant us the gift of your spirit, that he may direct all that we do and say. As for me, dear God, I ask you to take possession of my mind and speak through me very clearly with humility but with boldness. Touch the hearts of everyone listening, whether in my presence or by the internet. Let us all come to the end of this service with a very clear blessing from your word and a heart doubly desirous of obeying you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say amen and amen. Our subject for this morning, it's your move. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's my favorite verse in all the Bible. God created the heaven and the earth. Let's add to that Colossians chapter 1, reading verse 16. Do you have that? Colossians 1, reading verse 16. The Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, verse 17, and by him all things consist. And so the Bible says God, through Christ, made all things. When God makes something, he always does it well. Can you say amen for God? And so we read in Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day utter a speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no language nor speech where their voice is not heard. What those verses are saying, all over the world, in nature, there is evidence of the presence, the power, and the character of God. So when verse 3 says there's no language nor speech, what that means is there is no ethnic group regardless of the language that group speaks. Regardless of language barriers, are you following me? When you look at a sunset or a sunrise, when you look at a variety of flowers, of birds, of fish, of trees, the symmetry, the beauty, the mathematical precision of the universe, if you are honest, you will conclude Without knowing his name, there is a power that did this. And Eloi says there will be people in the kingdom who have never heard the name Jesus. But they have been touched by the evidences of his presence and his power. The heavens declare the glory of God. Therefore, it was God's original purpose when he created that he somehow would be detected in his creation. Now, this is not pantheism. What is pantheism? Pantheism is a belief that God is in a tree, he's in a rock, he's in a river, he's in this carpet. That's pantheism. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you examine snowflakes and you see each one is six-sided, hmm? 
and no two have the same design other than the six-sided you have to say who did this that is evidence of God's love for symmetry, beauty, and individuality. Yes. Are you with me? Amen. That's why it's a waste of time to try to be like the head elder. Or the preacher. Because God made you to reflect his character as you. Are you with me? No two people are made alike by God. And so the heavens declare the glory of God. In Romans chapter 1 verse 20 the Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Not the visible. The invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Even in this sin-sick world, there is enough evidence that there's a God. Evidence to allow God to say, you are without excuse. So let's stop worrying about the man in the jungle. God has a way for him to know there's a God. Let's worry about the person down the street from us. And so God created the heaven and the earth. Everything was fine. We read in verse 31 of Genesis 1. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was what? Very good. Very good. As God summarizes and he evaluates and he assesses and he steps back and he looks at what he has done. That's Friday afternoon. And God's conclusion, which is always correct, this is very good. What was very good? The light, the firmament, dry land, the sea, the grass, the trees, the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day, the birds of the air, the fishes of the sea on the fifth day, land animals, creeping things on the sixth, human beings on the sixth, marriage on the sixth, companionship on the sixth, limitations on the sixth, Eat that, don't eat that, limitations, Adam naming the animals, and all of that. God looked at all of that. When that system was done, he said, it is very good. Now, let's me, let us back up a couple steps to the sixth day. Verse 26 of Genesis 1, the Bible says, And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Mankind was made the last day of the six days of creation. The six working days. When Adam and Eve opened their eyes, they found themselves in a world that had everything they needed, right or wrong. Yes. They had a source of food, source of water, birds, beauty. Everything for a happy life had been provided by God. Now, God did not ask Adam and Eve, do you want me to make you? He just made them. But God does not operate by force. And so Revelation 3 verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and do what? And knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. But you've got to open. Now the devil kicks down the door. God knocks. And so having made Adam and Eve, God now had to give them the opportunity to decide. Do you want to remain in this perfect state? Do you want to remain in a world that is without flaw, without error, without suffering? And so God said in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now God says Adam and Eve. Well he spoke to Adam first. Eve had not yet been made when God told Adam that. So clearly Adam of course had to inform Eve. But they both knew. Adam. You can remain in this state. Having face to face communication with me. Fellowship with the angels. Fellowship with the animals, lions, tigers, wolves, crocodiles. The privilege of traveling and seeing other worlds. Dominion over the whole world. A conflict-free relationship with Sister Eve. 
No stillbirths. No disease. No war. Adam, you can live in a world like that. I have provided the world. That was my move. Now, it's your move. You show me if this is the kind of life that you want. And God says, the way you will show me is your relationship to my commandment. Are you not listening? You're sleeping with your eyes open. Are you listening? Amen. I know they're listening by internet. I know that. I can sense it. Now, if, if I catch any of you sleeping, I want the cameraman to put the camera on you. To expose you to the whole world if you sleep. Are you with me? All right. God said, Adam, whether or not you desire to live in a perfect world or a corrupt world will be determined by your relationship to my command. Which is the only way you can show your relationship to me. Ah, you didn't get it. You said, mm-hmm, courteously. You didn't get it. Let me say differently. The only way to be right with God is to be right with his law. God's amazing grace, page 20, paragraph 5, Ellen White writes, In the new birth, the heart is brought into harmony with God as it is brought into accord with his law. And so verse 16 of Genesis 2 says, And the Lord God commanded the man. That was a command. Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now let's look at the consequence for violating God's command. God said, you will what? Die. Death. That's all God said. He never said you'll be sick. But do we get sick as a result of sin? Mm -hmm. He did not say there will be war. But has sin produced war? Yes. He did not say there will be crime. He did not say there will be famine, plagues, natural disasters. God did not say that. All God said, if you sin, you will bring what into the world? Death. The Hebrew translation of thou shalt surely die is dying thou shalt die. Then what we have to see is that death is not just an instant, instantaneous act. The snuffing out of life just like that. Death is a process that terminates. Are you with me? With the snuffing out of life. And so sickness is an expression of what? Death. This death, which is the punishment for sin, it is expressed in sickness. It is expressed in war. It is expressed in famine. It is expressed in all the evils that contaminate this world. They are all expressions of the curse. If you eat, you die. Death expresses itself leading up to the point when this world is finally destroyed with sinners in it and a brand new world will be made death is not just an act it is a process it is a lifestyle what do i mean death is a lifestyle first timothy chapter 5 verse 6 the bible says she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 61, paragraph 2. God is the fountain of life. Listen carefully. And we can have life only as we are in communion with him. Separated from God, existence may be ours for a little time, but we do not possess life. Life. 
she draws a, a contrast between two things. What are they? Existence and life. Are you thinking? If I die, now I collapse, God forbid, dead, do I exist in a certain sense, physically? If someone came to bury me, would they confuse me with someone else? Who is that dead there? Randy Ski. Are you with me? In some sense, I exist, but I'm not living. That's physically. I exist because I'm still matter. A corpse is matter. I don't mean to be gross, but a corpse is matter. Are you with me? So I exist at that level. Now, you must take the, spirit, the physical and elevate it to the spiritual and draw lessons. The same thing occurs at the spiritual level. Anyone disconnected from God is dead. Now you're running around, breathing and coughing and sneezing, but you're dead. The Bible says that. If you weren't dead, why did Christ come to bring you alive? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Physically, you can be lifeless but exist as a corpse. Spiritually, you exist as a corpse. A corpse. Unless you are connected to the fountain of life, and that is God. Let's go back to Adam. Has anyone prayed for me yet? Good. For Adam to maintain a life without sin, or a, a perfect life, let's forget without sin, just a perfect life, it was based on obedience to God's law. Now, for those of you who are quick to say this man is preaching salvation by law keeping, I am not doing that. The law does not give you life. The law preserves the life God gives. I know that one got you. Mm -hmm, that got you. Which is good. It forces me to simplify. Let me say it again. The law does not give life. Only God can do that. But the law is the means by which God preserves life. And so Adam, if you want to continue with this life I gave you, obey my word. In medical ministry, page 9, paragraph 2, listen to these fascinating words. God has laws which he has instituted but they are only servants through which he affects results. What does effect mean in that context? To bring about, to cause to happen. Listen again. Listen. God has laws which he has instituted, but they are merely servants through which he affects results. So if God wants a grass to grow, God puts botanical laws in operation. Are you with me? He first creates the grass. Then the grass grows by law. That's why when we disobey God's law, what's the penalty? Death. Death. Because we have gone contrary to the thing that has been preserving what? Life. This kind of sermon is very difficult to preach because the carnal mind is naturally opposed to the concept of law. Well, the Bible says that. Romans 8 verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now, why? Because it is not subject. And this is something I say over and over. Because the moment you mention law, the moment you mention obey, something sets off in the mind. An automatic denial. Life is preserved by obedience to God's law. 
Let's go back to Genesis 2.17. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And I said, death is expressed in sickness, war, disease, famine, whatever. These are the works of death. Are you with me? Or the works of the flesh. Death came because of sin. Now, the power of death is wielded by Satan. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Death originated, came into this world because of Satan, not Adam. I should say into the universe. It came to this world because of Adam, but it was Satan working through Eve to get Adam. Are you with me? So the originator of death is Satan, not Adam. The originator of sin is Satan, not Adam. The carnal mind didn't begin with Adam. It began with Satan. Passed it on to Adam and Adam sinned. And so the works of death are the works of Satan. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, He that committeth sin, he that is involved in the works of Satan, is of the devil. What does of the devil mean? His child, his offspring, or her offspring. His offspring, he that committeth sin, not makes a mistake. A person whose lifestyle is sin is a child of the devil. The verse goes on to say, For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, we have the works of the devil, the expressions of death. And death is the last enemy that shall be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, I believe. Christ came to undo how much of Satan's works all of sin. Name some of them. Sickness, pain, war, crime, divorce, child stillbirth, genocide, suicide. Everything that Satan brought into the world, Jesus Christ came to undo. In the lives of those who will accept him and leave the works of Satan. So that the answer to war is nuclear weapons. Who develops nuclear weapons? Children of God? What's the answer to war? Christ. What's the answer to suffering? Christ. What's the answer to genocide? Christ. Who is the originator of genocide? Satan. Who is the answer to genocide? Christ. Who is the answer to whatever? Christ. Whatever Satan does, Christ came to destroy his works. And so Jesus is the answer for every problem and crisis that was not in God's original plan for this earth. So we have the works of Satan and we have the works of Christ. Listen to the works of Satan. As expressed in the flesh. Galatians 5 from verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. Adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. What does and such like mean? On and on and on. Satan's work. Works of the flesh. Verse 22 says, but the, fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Verse 23. Finish verse 23 for me. Against such. Finish it. Finish it. There's no law. Think. The Bible is a book of opposites. There is no law against what? Love. Joy, 
peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. There's no law against it. If the Bible is a book of opposites, if there's no law against it, what does that mean? There's a law for it. There's a law with which it is in harmony. Now listen to the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. You answer me. Is there a law against those? Yes. The same law against those is the law for love, joy, peace. Because the works of the flesh are the very opposite. It is, here's God's tool to preserve life, the law. How I relate to it, which is another way of saying how I relate to God, determines whether I fall on that side, the flesh, or that side, the spirit. To fall on that side, adultery, fornication, I must disobey God. To fall on this side, love, joy, peace, I must obey God. The standard doesn't change. Our relationship to it is the question. In the West Indian Messenger, July 1, 1912, paragraph 5, Ella White writes these words. The only question asked in the judgment will be, are they obedient to my commandments? One question. If you have heard me preach long enough, you know I love to preach about the law of God, uh, obedience, the word of God, the unique role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because we have been raised up by God for a very particular mission. One of those missions is to remind the world God has a law. And the reason why the world is in the problem it is in is because the world has disregarded the law of God. Not because of who's in power. We must think like God and see things like God. I don't care who sits in the White House, you will have problems. And with each one that passes and each one that succeeds, we get nearer and nearer the time of trouble. I don't care what color he is. Because prophecy cannot be held up by color. The Sunday law must come. I don't care if the president is polka dot. It must come. And so the world is in crisis because God's law has been ignored, disobeyed, trampled, yea, disregarded completely. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, As sin became general, it appeared less sinful. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Now, men marrying men no longer causes people to be shocked. Not because it is less bad. Because we're now accustomed. <laughs> You're not listening to me. Nah, you're not listening. You must have something in the oven at home. I understand. Let me say it again. That's why you must be careful what you watch, what you hear. Because the more you watch it, the less it horrifies you. Are you following me? I have some friends in South Africa, a young couple. They have two little boys, four and five or three and four something. I wrote them, I said, don't let your children watch TV at all. Not even 3ABN or Hope or Faith or whatever. Just don't watch it. Anything you think the TV will teach them, you teach them. Don't let them watch TV at all. Don't let them associate with children that are badly trained. Because they won't convert those little demons. Those little demons will corrupt them. Are you listening to me? And the mother wrote back and said, I turned off the TV. The father was in agreement. A week later, she wrote me, she said, I can't believe it. In one week, my children have forgotten their TV. And the only thing they talk about are the Bible verses I teach them. Because now that's all they know. Are you with me? That's all they know. Ellen White writes in Child Guidance, I think page 45, she says, Children who are raised learning lessons from nature are quick to detect the presence of God. When they are preserved from the 
corruption of the world, they are quick to detect the presence of God when they are raised nature's lesson book. What we expose ourselves to affects us. And so I go back. We are in a world, I go back to Genesis, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95, paragraph 3. As sin became general, it appeared less sinful, and they finally declared that the divine law was no longer in force. That it was contrary to God's character to punish transgression, and they denied that his judgments were to be visited upon the earth. That is where we head when we continue to expose ourselves to sinful influences. But God has a law. And God says, if you live by this, by my power, because you can't do it on your own, it's life. It's life. Patriots and Prophets, page 522, paragraph 3, God is a life giver. From the beginning, all his laws were ordained to life. But sin broke in upon the order that God had established, and discord followed. So we go back to Genesis. Adam and Eve were placed in a perfect world, where everything obeyed. Then God said, you show me if you want to live in a world where everything obeys. Here's a test. Eat of all these trees, leave this one alone, just one. They failed. And so when God came to Adam, he said, did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? My brothers and sisters, We need first to understand for ourselves that the law is a life preserver. The devil has convinced us that the law is slavery. You want to protect your family? Obey God's law. In obedience to God's law, man is surrounded as with a hedge and kept from the evil. He who breaks down this divinely erected barrier at one point has destroyed its power to protect him. Did you get that? Ah, let me say it again. Thoughts on the Mount of Blessing, page 52, paragraph 1. Listen. In obedience to God's commands, man is surrounded as with a hedge and kept from the evil. He who destroys or breaks down this divinely erected barrier. You know what she means by divinely erected? Who set it up? God has destroyed its power to protect him because he has opened the way by which the enemy can enter to waste and ruin. Listen to me. The Ten Commandments is a wall that keeps us safe. And our families preserves our health, our wealth. The Ten Commandments constitute God's hedge. Education, page 76, paragraph 4. And I keep giving this quotation because Ellen White is so universally disregarded. To our loss. Education, 76, paragraph 4. In, far from being f making arbitrary requirements, God's law is given to men as a hedge, a shield. Whoever accepts its principles is preserved from evil. The Bible is a simple book. Now there are challenging passages in Revelation. Daniel, Zechariah, Joel, Ezekiel. But let me tell you something. <laughs> what you need to know to get ready for Christ is as clear as crystal. You don't need to know who the king of the north or the northeast is. You need to know that your problem is sin. Are you with me? You don't need to know, well, how many wings did the cherubim have and uh, what color were the wings? All you need to know is the only answer to my sin is Christ. Are you following me? Now, watch me carefully. This is my visual aid. Here is sin. There's sin. Right under that heading we put Buddhists. Are we right? What's the Buddhist problem? Sin. Why are you hesitating? What, is the Buddhist a human being? I'm glad God still forgives sins. All right. Here is sin. 
Is that the Buddhist problem? Is that the Muslim's problem? Is that a Hindu's problem? Is that a Christian's problem? Is that the atheist's problem? Sin, we all have the same problem. How do you solve that problem? Here's Christ. Is that the answer for the Buddhist? The Muslim? The Hindu? The Jew? The atheist? Yes. So what we have is one common problem. One solution. There's only one way for a Buddhist to sin. Tell me what that is. Break the law. There's only one way for a Muslim to sin. Tell me what that is. Break the law. If that's the way Satan sinned, <laughs> what about the Buddhist or the Muslim or the Christian? When we forget these simple guidelines that must never change from Genesis to Revelation, that's when we get into all this useless discussion. Listen to me, there are some things that never change once you understand them. One, God is responsible for the entire creation. That never is creator. And he did it through Christ, so it's Christ. Two, it was done by the word. This has power. From gen never change your view. This has power. Are you with me? And everything God does, he does through his word. Three, sin is disobeying God's command. And the Lord God commanded. Sin from Genesis to Revelation is violation of God's command. So that wherever you see sin in the Bible, you must see command. Or iniquity or transgression. Because the penalty for sin, transgression and iniquity is the same. There are some Bible scholars who make a difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity. Fine, fine, fine. But you show me where transgression has a different penalty from iniquity. Death is a separation of the life from the body. You go back to the grave. That is from Genesis to Revelation. The world has two groups. Those who obey and those who disobey. That's from Genesis to Revelation. How you run a church service may change. Who you pray to should never change. Are you with me? Your liturgy may change. The heart and soul of your service should never change. And for today, from Genesis to Revelation, God has one way to test our loyalty to him one and that is our relationship to his law and his law is designed to preserve life that he gave that's why whenever i talk to people i have this problem that problem i always begin with let's look at your spiritual life Always begin at the spiritual life and pray like David in Psalm 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. Try me and see if there be what? Any wicked way in me. See. Because when I look, I see nothing. I see a saint. When God looks, He sees so much, he has to reveal it piece by piece or we would be overwhelmed. Are you following me? So I always begin, let us examine your walk with God. Not that your boss is harsh. Maybe or may not be. How is it between you and God? When you are right with God, and to be right with God, you have to be right with his divine standard of righteousness, his law. That life preserver, not life giver, life preserver. When you're right with him, by being right with his law, God covers every area of your life. You see, then you become legally his. I'm preaching several sermons in morning. What time is it? What time did I start? All right. Well, I'll stop when I'm done. You become legally his. Now, let me flip that. When we live a life of sin, we become legally Satan's property. Ah, you need to get this. Listen to me. Are you listening? Sin makes us the legal property of Satan. 
A different way of saying that is Satan has a right which God respects to the sinner's life. You didn't hear what I said. God respects Satan's right to your life or my life if we live a life of sin. He has a right and God respects it. And to cancel that right, Jesus had to die. Having died for the cancellation to go to the next step, we have to accept that death and resurrection. And why is that death necessary? To satisfy the broken law. It, you and I, when we sin, are legal possessions of Satan. And God, all, God does everything legally. You didn't hear me. This is not legalism. God does everything legally. Listen to a popular verse you know so well. If we confess our sins. Say it with me. He is faithful and just. Stop. Stop. I said stop, Elder Wallace. I said stop. <laughs> I know you're trying to impress the people on the internet, but I said stop. Now, if we confess our sins, Brother Jim, he is faithful and just. Now, we know what faithful means. You can rely on him to do it. Hmm? Do you understand what just is? God can't forgive you illegally. No, you didn't get it. You got it, Marie? All right. I don't believe you, but all right. <laughs> Listen again. God cannot forgive you illegally. In other words, God's forgiveness cannot offend what? His law. So that forgiveness is a legal transaction. He is faithful and just. In other words, to forgive you, he needs somebody's blood. Are you with me? Now, it won't be your blood because you've confessed. But your confession and mine does not remove the need for blood. It removes the need for your blood. But the law still requires blood. Whose blood is that? Jesus, can somebody say amen? Amen. Because someone has to die and died on the basis of that, God can forgive you and me. That's a legal transaction. That came into being out of grace. Are you with me? Let me close the book so you know I'm finishing. The law of God, as I conclude, it's your move, is perhaps the greatest expression of grace. Hmm? People try to make a difference between law and grace. There's no difference between law and grace. There's no conflict. The law is an act of grace because without it, you and I would never know that we're what? And need whom? Jesus. So we would sin and sin and sin believing that's the way to live. Listen to me. The law of God is an act of grace. Oh, thank God for the first commandment, which says what? Did you hear me? I ask you what the first commandment says. Jeez. This is not good. Are the people still on the internet listening? Let's say the first commandment together. Thou shall have no other gods before me. That is grace. You know what Paul says? For I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said. Meaning the only way to know I am in trouble is to look at God's law. And since he can't save you, it points you to Christ. What does the second commandment say? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So those who hate him do what? Come on, come on, come on. If those love me, keep my commandments. Those who hate me, do what? They break them. Think. 
have me slapping my head all morning. Think. Yeah. Commandment three, what does it say? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That is an expression of grace. Commandment four, now you should make some noise as they say. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That is an expression of grace. To let the whole world know you are wrong. That day you worship on is not mine. Commandment 5, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. We need to understand father and mother applies to the older members of the church. Amen. First Timothy 5 verse 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brothers, the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity. Father, mother, brother, and sister begins in the home, extends to the church. Commandment 6 says what? Thou shalt not kill, act of grace. Commandment 7, thou shalt not commit adultery, act of grace. Commandment 8, thou shalt not steal, act of grace. Commandment 9, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, act of grace. Commandment 10, thou shalt not covet, an act of grace. Church, it's your move. I want you to make a commitment this morning. You and I will make it. Let's obey God. Is that hard to understand? Do you need to know Greek, Hebrew, Akkadian, Swahili? Obey God. The happiness of the angelic host consisted in the perfect obedience to law. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 22, paragraph 3. Let me say it again. The happiness of the angelic host consisted in the perfect obedience to law. And who set up that system? The Creator. And who was he? Christ. Because of sin, no one can keep God's law. I have to say that. Because of the carnal nature, no one by himself or herself can keep a standard that expresses the very righteousness of God. We need divine help. That help comes to us when we give our lives to Christ. When you give your life to Christ, through the Spirit, Christ comes into you. And as that surrender is renewed daily, Christ, in his mysterious way through the Spirit, I can't explain it, lives out his life in you. And anything Christ does in you is perfect. Because God judges the heart. Are you with me? And when Christ is in the heart, he lives out the life in you. The Father accepts that's life without complaint. It's your move. And so this morning I say to God, Father, I recommit my life to you. Give me the strength, the will to obey you without question. Notice I said, give me the strength because I don't have it. Now, we must have the willingness. But willingness and strength are two different things. Are you with me? We must have the willingness. And God combines that with his strength. And the reality comes before our eyes. Obedience to God. How many of you will say, Father, give me the life of Christ. That I may live a life that pleases you. And a life that pleases God is an obedient life. Can I see your right hand? Uh, God bless you. Would you stand with me? Stand with me, please.
Let me say it before I pray. God gives life. He preserves it through his laws. There's a law that says gases or the atmosphere or the wind moves from area of concentration to an area of low concentration. Are you with me? If that were not the case, that law, we could not transport oxygen to the blood vessels and carbon dioxide to the lungs. Are you with me? As the blood brings concentrated carbon dioxide, it moves into the lungs with a low level of carbon dioxide. And the high concentration of oxygen in the lungs moves into the blood, which has a low concentration of uh, oxygen. And so you have this transfer. That law has to function or you and I would drop dead. Law preserves life. Is there anyone who needs Bible studies that may lead to baptism? Can I see your right hand? Anyone who needs Bible studies that may lead to baptism? Raise your right hand. Whether it leads to it or not, you need Bible studies. Can I see your hand? Raise your hand. Says that Kathy needs Bible studies. Let me tell you something. Now Kathy raised her hand. There are a lot of Adventists who have been in the church since 1844 who need Bible studies. Are you listening to me? Because they understand nothing about what the church knows, uh, the church believes, need. Kathy, God bless you. Who has, because Roberta, 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 are you still in charge of Bible study? Okay. Anyone else? You need Bible study? Sister from London. Yeah, Sister Magdalene. Nikki. Get together. Okay, my dear sister, Yes. This is no joke. There are a lot of us who pretend we know what it's all about, and we don't. We have no clue. So we're blown about with every wind of doctrine. And we want to be like every other church, except the church God called us to be, because we don't know. Coming to church for two hours does not make you an Adventist. Anyone else? I need Bible study. Anyone else? I have Kathy. Sister Mattingly, have Nikki. Sister, give me your name again. Sister Patricia Allen. Patricia, we have Patricia. We have five. Who else? Okay, we're in the back. Okay, sister, is that is that Danielle? Okay, yes. No, this is no joke. Remember, how many virgins were they? All ten were virgins. Hmm. How many got, went to the wedding feast? Five. We didn't have five virgins, five prostitutes. We had ten virgins. Only five were saved. There will be virgins lost. When the service is over, those who raise your hands, just come to the front, let Roberta get your names, set up a schedule, start the studies. You will never regret it. And if you're too shy to raise your hands, come and join quietly. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, for having given life. You put the law in place to preserve that life. We thank you, Lord, that despite Adam's catastrophe, you had a plan to undo his disaster. That plan is Christ. And according to your word in 1 John 3, 8, all that the devil has done, Christ came to undo. And so Christ is the answer to every single thing they got. And so today we recommit our lives to this Christ who understands us having lived in human form, who still possesses human form. Father, we ask you through the indwelling Christ, he indwells us through his spirit, let him live out his obedient life in us so that obeying you becomes our greatest joy. As your servant Eloi says in Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph 4, the law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no reward for its obedience because it is such a good law. Please, God, give us divine common sense to see that our spiritual protection is to live within the wall of that law. Bless those who raise their hands for Bible study, Father. Give them a serious heart because the word is life. For those who are contemplating studying, Father, 
move their hearts in the, in the direction of saying yes. Bless this church today, God. Those watching by internet, bless them. We thank you for their presence in heart with us. Draw us close to your bosom, dear God, because the times ahead are rough. Help us to hold on to you tenaciously and say like Jacob, I will not let you go except you bless me. And even after you bless me, I'm not letting go. And usher us into your kingdom when you come. We offer this prayer earnestly, seriously, in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, Amen and Amen.